Welcome back to Pragmatics. So here's where we are in the course. We are done with core linguistics, the nuts and bolts of how human language works. And now we've entered into the world where we get to apply our knowledge of how language works in order to study things like how language is used, how language exists in our minds, how language technology works. And in particular, what we're looking at now is pragmatics. Pragmatics is kind of like the micro scale dynamics of how language is used in things like conversations. So pragmatics is the study of how people use language in context. In semantics, we saw that the sense and the reference of an utterance is called its propositional meaning. So we can use semantics to derive the propositional meaning of an utterance which is also called surface meaning. But sentences can be used in contexts in ways that go beyond the propositional meaning in order to convey intents, which might be different from the propositional meanings. The intent of an utterance is simply the reason the speaker said the utterance. It turns out that in normal conversation, the way that we deduce a speaker's intent is by assuming that they are following the cooperative principle. So the cooperative principle says that your speaker is trying to contribute cooperatively to the shared purpose of the conversation. When someone appears to violate the cooperative principle, we conclude that they're actually expressing some other hidden intent which does follow the principle. When we infer an in intent this way, the inference is called an implicature. So here's our example of basic pragmatic reasoning. So Alice asks, is Jamie dating anyone these days? Establishing that the shared conversational goal is let's exchange information about Jamie. Then Bob says, I think she's dating someone in Cleveland. Well, in that case, Bob's utterance answers the question. Simply in terms of its propositional meaning, it follows the cooperative principle. So Alice's pragmatic reasoning goes, First I ask, does the propositional meaning expressed by Bob's utterance follow the cooperative principle? In this case, yes. And then no further inference required. We can accept the propositional meaning as is. But suppose Bob says, well, she goes to Cleveland every weekend. Then Alice is going to think, well, does that follow the cooperative principle in terms of its propositional meaning? And it doesn't because Bob is not directly saying anything about whether Jamie is dating anyone. Bob is saying something about Jamie's travel habits. Jamie could be going to Cleveland for any number of reasons, right? So Alice is going to think, no, on the surface, in terms of the surface meaning, this does not follow the cooperative principle. And yet, I know that Bob is in fact following the principle, so he must intend some further hidden meaning that does follow the principle. Therefore, Alice can conclude Bob's hidden meaning is, I think Jamie is dating someone in Cleveland. And that inference step is what's called an implicature. So the utterance, well, she goes to Cleveland every weekend in this particular context, implicates the proposition that Bob thinks that Jamie is dating someone in Cleveland. We talked about Grice's maxims. Grice's maxims are a way of taking the cooperative principle and decomposing them into four component parts, the maxim of quantity, of quality, maxim of relevance, maxim of quantity, and the maxim of manner. And we're going to go into these in some more detail today with some further examples of how these maxims are used and how they might actually be intentionally violated to convey information in conversations. So the maxim of quality says that in normal conversation, we assume that people do not say things they believe to be false, and they do not say things for which they lack adequate evidence. So if Alice says John has two PhDs, Bob thinks Alice is following the maxim of quality, therefore I can infer, I can draw the implicature that Alice has adequate evidence that John has two PhDs. If it turned out that this was just a rumor. John does not actually have two PhDs, and Alice did not in fact have good reason for saying this, then Bob would have reason to think of Alice as being someone who is uncooperative. 
that's the maximum of quality. It's when you assume that people are telling the truth and that they have good reason to say the things they say. This kind of implicature, when you use this, when Bob draws this implicature in this case, this, we call that a quality implicature because the implicature is based on the maxim of quality. The next one is the maxim of relevance. Maxim of relevance says that in normal conversation, we assume that speakers are talking about the same thing. Suppose Alice says, my car is out of gas, establishing that the conversational goal is, let's help me out of this predicament where I'm out of gas. Then Bob says, there's a gas station around the corner. Okay, Alice can think, Bob's following the maxim of relevance, so this gas station must be helpful to my problem. Therefore, the gas station must be open, or at least Bob must think it's open. Alice can draw the implicature that Bob thinks that the gas station around the corner is open. Now, suppose Alice goes around the corner and goes to the gas station and it's closed, and it turns out Bob knew it was closed. Well, Bob wasn't lying but he wasn't really being cooperative, right? So Alice would have reason to think of Bob as uncooperative in that case. When Alice assumes that Bob is cooperative, then when he says there's a gas station around the corner, she can infer that he thinks that gas station is open. And that is a relevance implicature because it's an implicature based on the maxim of relevance. Next, the maxim of quantity says that in normal conversation, we assume speakers contribute as much information as is required, and they do not contribute more information than is required. So suppose Alice asks, how far can you run without stopping? And Bob responds, 10 miles. Alice can think something like, Bob's following the maximum of, of quantity, so he's not being under-informative. So what Alice must, what Bob must mean is that Bob can run 10 miles and no more. Suppose Bob can actually run 20 miles. Then it's true that he can run 10 miles, and in addition to that, he can run another 10 miles. So Bob wouldn't be lying if he said he could run 10 miles, but he would be violating the maximum of quantity because he wouldn't be providing the right amount of information. So based on Bob's utterance that he can run 10 miles, Alice can draw the implicature that Bob can run 10 miles and no more and that is what's called a quantity implicature. And this kind of implicature is actually so common that it has a special name, which is called a scalar implicature. The idea is that the distance Bob can run is like a scale. And when you indicate that you can run some amount on the scale, like 10 miles, your interlocutor is going to assume that you mean that amount and no more. So whenever there's an implicature where you're basically imputing something like and no more, that's typically a quantity implicature. Another example, suppose um, someone asks Alice, how many students pass the test? And Alice says, some of the students pass the test. Okay, so Bob can think, well, Alice is following the maxim of quantity, so she's not being under informative. Therefore, Bob can draw the implicature that not all of the students pass the test. When Alice says this, this must implicate that some of the students failed the test. Now notice that if all the students actually did pass the test, suppose there's 100 students and all of them passed, when I say some of the students pass the test, I just mean that greater than zero students pass the test. That's the propositional meaning. So when I say some of the students pass the test, that's compatible with all of the students having passed the test. But Bob can draw the implicature when, I, when Alice says this, that not all the students pass the test. So if all of the students pass the test, then it would be under informative of Alice to say some of the students pass the test. Therefore, when Bob is using the maximum of quantity, he can conclude that when Alice says some of the students pass the test, her intent is to convey that not all of the students pass the test. Maxim of manner says that in normal conversation, we assume speakers basically speak in a way which is as simple as possible. So they don't use words that are unnecessarily hard. They avoid ambiguity, they're brief, and they're orderly. So for example, if I say I started the car, that is a simple way of expressing that I started the car. 
When I say I got the car started, that's a slightly more complex way of speaking, right? I'm using more words. Utterance B violates the maxim of manner. So utterance B implicates something else. If I say I got the car started, that implicates that maybe I had some difficulty getting the car started. So let's do some examples. Let's think about what maxim is being used in the following implicatures. And here's our list of maxims. We have quality, relevance, quantity, and manner. So Alice asks, are you hungry? And Bob says, that cake looks delicious. What do you think is Bob's intent here? Well, I think Alice would be fair to conclude that what Bob is really saying is that he wants to eat the cake, right? Okay, so what maxim would Alice be using to draw that conclusion? It would be relevance, because Alice concludes that what Bob is saying is relevant to the conversational goal of establishing Bob's state of hunger and whether he wants to eat. And when Bob says that cake looks delicious, it must be relevant to that goal. So therefore, we conclude that Bob is indeed hungry and he wants to eat the cake. That's a relevance implicature. How about this? Alice says it's going to rain tomorrow. Bob concludes Alice must have looked at a weather report. So Bob is thinking Alice must have good reason for saying what she said. She must have good evidence for the claim that she made that it's going to rain tomorrow. That would be a quality implicature. So Bob's using the maxim of quality. How about this? Alice says, I have three cats. Bob concludes, Alice has three cats and no more. So it's not the case that she has 10 cats. If she had 10 cats, it would be true that she had three cats and then seven more also. But Bob concludes that Alice has three cats and no more. What kind of implicature is that? Well, that's using the maxim of quantity. Remember when the conclusion is something like and no more, that's a scalar implicature, which is a quantity implicature. How about this? Alice, can Charlie do his linguistics homework? Bob, well, he's capable of doing it. Alice concludes Charlie's not doing his homework. All right. So notice that Bob didn't say he's not doing his homework. Presumably, him being capable of doing his homework and him actually doing his homework are compatible. There's certainly many possible worlds in which both of those are true. But we can conclude that what Bob is saying that is that he's actually not doing his homework. How does that work? Well, which maxim applies here? It would be quantity. And it's quantity because if it were the case that Bob was doing his homework, then, sorry, if it were the case that Charlie was doing his homework, then Bob would have just said yes. Bob would have said, yes, he is doing his linguistics homework. But Bob didn't say that. Bob said, well, he's capable of doing it. So we assume Bob's not being over-informative and not being under-informative. So it must be the case that Charlie is capable of doing it and no more. He's capable of doing it and he's not doing it. So that is a quantity implicature. Now there's another way in which maxims are used, not just for drawing implicatures. There's a way in which maxims can actually be violated intentionally by speakers with the understanding that listeners will draw some certain implicature. So we usually follow Grice's maxims in conversation, but sometimes we intentionally violate them. And these are especially fun and interesting examples. The reason we violate them, and we usually do so in an extreme and an obvious way, is because we know the listener is going to consciously note the violation and draw an implicature. This is called flouting a maxim. When you violate a maxim in a conspicuous way, that's called flouting the maxim. For example, here's a scenario. Alice and Bob are at a party. Charlie is also at the party, but Alice doesn't know it yet. Bob sees that Charlie is coming around the corner but Alice doesn't see Charlie yet. So this guy, Charlie is approaching. Bob, Alice doesn't know that Charlie is approaching, but Bob does. Alice says, isn't Charlie the biggest jerk you've ever met? Uh-oh, right? And then Bob says, weather sure is nice this time of year, isn't it? Okay, so let's analyze this conversational turn. Bob said the weather sure is nice this kind of year, isn't it? This is a clear violation of the maxim of relevance, right? Alice has established that the conversational goal is complaining about Charlie. And Bob has said something which is completely irrelevant. It's noticeably irrelevant. It's conspicuously irrelevant, conspicuously violating the maxim of relevance. 
So what does Alice conclude? Well, I would say Alice would be fair to conclude from this that we should stop talking about Charlie, because maybe Charlie is close, right? So here's another example. The scenario is that there was a party last night, and at the party, Bob sang a song. Alice, the next morning, is describing the party to, to someone else and says, Bob produced a series of sounds corresponding to the score of the Star Spangled Banner. So first of all, what maxim is Alice flouting? Alice is intentionally violating one of the maxims. The maxim that she's violating is the maxim of manner, because if Bob just sang the song and everything was fine, she would just say Bob sang the Star Spangled Banner. But she didn't say that. She said Bob produced a series of sounds corresponding to the score of Star Spangled Banner. So do you think that Bob sang this song with beautiful skill? Do you think that this was something that people enjoyed listening to? No, right? You, you can tell that Bob did not sing this song well. But that's not in the propositional meaning here. The propositional meaning here is perfectly consistent with Bob being a good singer. But you notice that this was phrased in a weird way. It was phrased in this unusual marked way which intentionally violates the maxim of manner, and so you can conclude that Alice is expressing some hidden meaning, which is that Bob was terrible at singing the song. How about this? So Alice says, I can run 10 miles. Bob says, yeah, and I'm the Queen of England. Okay, so which maxim is Bob flouting? Bob is saying something which very severely and very conspicuously violates one of Grice's maxims. Yeah, because first, okay, is Bob the Queen of England? Is, 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 it, is it likely to you that Bob is in fact the Queen of England? No, the Queen of England is a particular person, and it's not Bob. So Bob is violating the maxim of quality. He's doing so in a way which is conspicuous. He is flouting the maxim of quality. And so Alice can draw a conclusion. Alice can draw the conclusion that what Bob is expressing is, I don't believe you, right? Here's another example. This is an example I used last time. So you ask your teacher for a letter of recommendation. The teacher writes, to whom it may concern, Ms. Smith is very polite and is always on time for her classes. Sincerely yours, Teacher Bob. Okay, so when a teacher writes a letter like this, the teacher knows that the person reading it is going to draw the implicature that Ms. Smith is not a good student. This is a letter which is outrageously flouting the maxim of quantity. It's outrageously providing too little information such that the person who receives the letter will draw that implicature that says Ms. Smith is very polite, always time on time for her classes, and no more, and there's nothing else good I can say. So this is flouting the maxim of quantity, intentionally being underinformative so that the person who receives the letter is going to draw a certain implicature. So I want to go through some examples and some tests for distinguishing this idea of implicature from this idea of entailment. So remember that entailment, as we studied in semantics, means that if one utterance is true, the other utterance has to be true in terms of its propositional meaning. So when one utterance entails another, that means if the first one is true, the second one has to be true in all possible worlds. Implicatures, on the other hand, are conclusions that we draw based on how an utterance is used and the cooperative principle. Implicatures do not have to be true. They are things that we infer are probably true. So for example, suppose we have this utterance Ian eats a large breakfast every day. Now, does that imply, does that entail, or does that implicate the sentence, uh, Ian eats a large breakfast every Monday? Well, let's think. If Ian eats a large breakfast every day, then is it the case in all possible worlds where the first one is true that Ian also eats a large breakfast every Monday? Well, yes, because Monday is a subset of every day. So here we have an entailment relationship. The first proposition entails the second. How about this? Alice asks, have you finished all your homework? Bob says, I've finished my history homework. Alice concludes, Bob has finished his history homework and no more. Is this an entailment or is this an implicature? It's an implicature. 
because it's possible that Bob has finished all of his homework. There is a possible world in which he has finished all his homework. In fact, in every possible world in which he's finished all his homework, he's also finished his history homework, right? But he didn't say he finished all his homework. He said he finished his history homework, and Alice concluded that he finished his history homework and no more based on the maxim of quantity. So this is implicature. There is a test you can use to distinguish entailment from implicature. If you want, you have two propositions, you want to know do they entail or do they implicate. The test is that an implicature can be canceled without creating a contradiction, whereas an entailment cannot. And I'll explain what that means with an example. Suppose Alice asks, have you finished all your homework? Bob says, I've finished my history homework. And so Alice concludes that Bob has not done all his homework. Bob's done his history homework and no more. That's an implicature. Now this implicature can be canceled in the following way. Bob could go on to say, in fact, I've finished all my homework. So I've finished my history homework, and in fact, I've finished all my homework. That would cancel the implicature. So if Bob goes on to say this second sentence, then Alice's implicature is going to be forgotten. It's going to be canceled. Implicatures can be canceled in this way. On the other hand, let's look at our entailment example. Let's say we have the sentence, Ian eats a large breakfast every day. That entails the sentence, Ian eats a large breakfast every Monday. Can you cancel the entailment? Could someone go on to say, in fact, he doesn't eat a large breakfast on Mondays. So Ian eats a large breakfast every day. In fact, he doesn't eat a large breakfast on Mondays. No, you can't do that. That would create a, co a contradiction. That would create an incoherent utterance. So the entailment cannot be canceled. Another example, Alice asks, are you going to the party tonight? Bob says, I'm not into parties. Alice concludes that Bob's not going to the party tonight. That's a relevance implicature. But Bob might go on to say, but I'm going anyway. And then the implicature would be canceled. Another example, Alice might ask, how many children do you have? Bob might say, I have six children. Alice can conclude from that that Bob has at least five children, right? So in fact, he has six, and therefore he has at least five. That would be an entailment relationship. In every world in which Bob has six children, it must be the case that Bob has more than five children, right? That's just simple logic. That's an entailment. Can this be canceled? Could Bob go on to say, in fact, I have less than five? No, it wouldn't make any sense at all for Bob to say, I have six children. In fact, I have less than five. So you can't continue the utterance in that way while still being coherent. The entailment cannot be canceled. So, to summarize Grice's maxims and their application, we always assume in normal conversation that speakers are following the cooperative principle. When they appear to violate it, that means that we will fill in a hidden meaning, a hidden intent, so that they are not violating it, and that's called implicature. The cooperative principle consists of four maxims. You have quality, relevance, quantity, and manner. People can either follow the maxims, or they can flout the maxims by violating them in an obvious way so that someone will draw an implicature. Flouting the maxims results in implicatures that are very different from the propositional meanings. You can distinguish an implicature from an entailment because an entailment cannot be canceled, but an implicature can be canceled. Now, as our last topic in pragmatics, I'm going to talk about something called speech acts. Speech acts refers to a categorization of the different reasons that we have for producing utterances. So what are some things we use language for? When I say something like, John Jones was at the office yesterday until 6. When I ask a question like, who ate all the cookies? When I produce a command like, sit down and be quiet. When I say, please let me know if you'll be attending. If I say, if you do that again, I'll report you. Notice that there are different intents underlying these utterances. There are different purposes behind them. Some of them are about sharing information. Some are about requesting information. Some are about demanding action. 
Watch out, there's a huge pothole there. This one is about providing useful information to prevent you from getting into trouble. If I say five bucks says the Rams will beat the Saints this year, this, this is an old uh, Super Bowl reference, then uh, this is establishing a promise. It's establishing a bet, which is a kind of promise. That's a kind of speech act. If I say you ought to go to class at least once a week, that's providing advice. So an action which is performed by language is called a speech act. Speech acts, um, we categorize speech acts by their functions. So an assertion is an utterance which has the function of conveying information. If I say Bob was late to class, I'm conveying information to you that is an assertion. A question is a speech act whose function is to request information. If I ask, was Bob late? I'm trying to get information from you. That's a certain kind of speech act called a question. A request is a speech act which has the function of um, getting the other person to do something. It elicits action. An order is like a very strong form of a request. It demands action. It elicits action with potentially severe consequences to follow if that action does not, in fact, happen. A promise is a speech act which has the function of committing a speaker to some certain action in the future. A threat is, as a kind of promise, it commits the speaker to an action which is adversive to the listener. This is a sample of the set of possible speech acts, and it shows the variety of functions that are conveyed by utterances in language. Of course, there's more. If you tried to enumerate all the different kinds of speech acts, you would find it's a very long list. There's a certain special kind of speech act called a performative speech act. A performative speech act is a speech act in which the action named by the verb in the sentence is accomplished by the speech act itself. So this is a speech act whose function is accomplished simply by the utterance, by producing the utterance itself. The verb in that case is called a performative verb. So for example, if I say something like, I assert that Jones was in the office until six yesterday, I'm explicitly naming my speech act, right? My assertion is accomplished by this utterance. When I say, I assert that Jones was at the office until six yesterday, this is the kind of thing you might say in like court proceedings where it's very important that your speech acts be made unambiguous. In this case, we have a performative verb which explicitly names the speech act. If I say something like, I ask again, who ate the cookies? When I say, I ask, I'm naming my own speech act. So it's completely clear what the speech act is. When I say, I order you to sit down and be quiet, that's a performative verb because I'm naming the speech act within the utterance itself. If I say, I bet you five bucks that the Rams beat the Saints, that's a performative verb, the verb bet is the performative verb there. And when I say, I hereby pronounce you man and wife, this is making a legal proclamation. And that legal proclamation is actually established by the utterance itself. Notice that this is not the kind of utterance which might be true or false. This utterance is serving the function of changing some legal state about the world. When you say, I hereby pronounce you man and wife, then the verb itself, the, the utterance, changes the state of the world. So this is a performative speech act. Similarly, when I say I christen this ship, the USS language, when I say I christen a, a, the ship to be X, then that the, the christening, the naming event there, actually is accomplished by the speech act itself. This is a performative speech act. Or when I say we declare the defendant not guilty, these are performative speech acts. This leads us into the distinction between direct and indirect speech acts. Speech acts can be direct or indirect. A direct speech act, uh, we'll, I'll compare them with indirect speech acts here. So an in, a direct speech act would be like if I asked the question, did John marry Helen? This is a direct speech act because it has the form of a question. If I say something like, I'm asking you whether John married Helen, that's also direct. There's no question about whether this is a question. This, because I say, I am asking you, it's completely explicit that this is a question. 
An indirect speech act might be if I say, you know, I don't know whether John married Helen. Maybe when I say that, I actually am hoping to elicit information from you. So the speech act is actually a question. But it's indirect because the form of the sentence, well, it doesn't have a question mark at the end. It doesn't have the syntactic form of a question. It's in terms of its sentence type, it's actually a statement. It's declarative. But the actual speech act here, my intent is to ask a question. When I say, I don't know whether John married Helen, maybe I'm actually asking a question. Similarly, I might say, do you know whether John married Helen? That would be an indirect speech act because although it has the form of a question, I'm not asking directly whether John married Helen. I'm asking whether you know that John married Helen. So it would be possible for you in principle to respond to this by saying, yes, I know, without saying whether the answer is yes or no. That would be very uncooperative, but that would be in keeping with the form of the question here. This is an indirect speech act. Or I might say something like, I would like to know whether John married Helen. That's pretty clearly a question in terms of a speech act. It's eliciting information, and yet it doesn't have the form of a question. So speech acts can be direct or indirect. Direct speech acts look like this. If I say, please take out the garbage, that's a command. If I say, the garbage hasn't been taken out yet, that might be a command. If I say, I request that you take out the garbage, that is directly a request. But if I ask the question, would you mind taking out the garbage, that's not on its surface in terms of its form, a request, rather it's a question, but it's an indirect speech act whose goal is to get you to take out the trash. Or I might say, I would like for you to take out the garbage. Well, in terms of the form of the sentence, it looks like an assertion that about things I like, but in fact, it's a request for you to take out the garbage. In order to distinguish direct from indirect spe speech acts, we need to introduce this idea of sentence types. So there are different sentence types that express different speech acts by default. A sentence type is based on the form of the sentence. A sentence type is a syntactic form of a sentence. A speech act is the function of a sentence. These have certain default associations, but these associations are not absolute. So for example, a declarative sentence is something that has the form like this. Bob is cooking the chicken. That's declarative. A declarative sentence is a sentence that uses the rule that a sentence can consist of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase in English. An interrogative sentence is something that looks like this. Is Bob cooking the chicken? Question mark. So in writing, we indicate that with a question mark. The syntactic rule here, notice that the sentence starts with a verb, so it's not actually using the syntactic rule that says a sentence can consist of a noun phrase followed by a verb phrase. This actually is a different sentence type. In terms of the form of the sentence, it is an interrogative, not a declarative. And we have in imperative sentence types, which look like this. When I say, cook the chicken, that has a different syntactic form than the other sentence types. Note that it doesn't have a noun phrase at the beginning. So in terms of its sentence type, this is what we call an imperative. Now, declaratives usually go with assertions in terms of speech acts. Interrogatives usually go with questions in terms of speech acts, and imperatives usually go with commands and requests in terms of speech acts. So the default speech act for each of these is that a declarative corresponds to an assertion, interrogative corresponds to a question, imperative corresponds to a request or an order. And here we have a nice table which shows that these different sentence types can each be used to express all the different speech acts. So each sentence type has a default speech act, but you could use another sentence type to express a speech act, in which case it's an indirect speech act. A speech act is direct when either it uses its default sentence type or it has a performative verb. A speech act is indirect when it uses a non-default sentence type and when it doesn't have a performative verb. So it's direct if it's using a default sentence type or a performative verb. Examples being, did John marry Helen? Speech act is a question. Form of the sentence is interrogative. 
I'm asking you whether John married Helen. Well, the sentence type is declarative, but it has a performative verb, I'm asking you, so therefore this is a direct speech act. An indirect speech act would be when I say like, oh, you know, I don't know whether John married Helen. It's actually a question, but the sentence type is declarative. Or when I say, do you know whether John married Helen? Again, an indirect speech act. The sentence type is interrogative, but it's not interrogative about whether John married Helen. Or when I say, I'd like to know whether John married Helen, sentence type is declarative, but the speech act is actually a question, so this is an indirect speech act. When I say, please take out the garbage, the sentence type is performative. So the indirect speech act equivalent would be like when I say, the garbage hasn't been taken out yet. So on its form, the sentence type there is declarative, but the actual speech act is a request or maybe even a command. When I say, I request that you take out the garbage, the sentence type is an assertion, but it has a performative verb. So this is a direct speech act. When I ask the question, would you mind taking out the garbage? That is an indirect speech act. The sentence type is interrogative. Or when I say, I would like for you to take out the garbage, the sentence type is declarative, but the speech act is question, this is indirect. So to summarize speech acts, speech acts are the kinds of actions performed by utterances. They're determined by their function. The major categories of speech act are assertions, questions, and orders. And these are associated with certain sentence types. A sentence type is part of the form, the syntactic form of a sentence. And the major sentence types are declarative, interrogative, and imperative. Those are associated with speech acts. Speech acts can be direct or indirect. It's direct if it uses its default sentence type or if it uses a performative verb. 